Okay, I'm going to start then. Well, good afternoon and welcome. We have, I hope, uh, 300 people, or, or anyway, if we've unmuted and gathered them in, that is the number that have registered. I very much hope you're joining us. I'm Chairman of Lund Humphreys, and it's my pleasure to welcome you and to this celebration and panel discussion on the day we publish the book, Diana Casson's book, closed on Mondays, behind the scenes of the museum. Let me introduce the people who are going to be on the panel, starting with our author, Dinah Casson. Dinah, as she said, was born into the world of architectural plans, um, because of course her father, Sir Hugh Casson, uh, and so she thinks that uh, planning and designing are as familiar to her as the stories of Peter Rabbit, I seem to read somewhere. <laughs> she is the co-founder of Roger Mann, who's and their design business has designed exhibitions and gallery spaces all over Europe, Russia, US, Australia. I'm here actually in France, halfway between uh, Bordeaux, which is the Cité uh, du Rhin, the installation there, and the remarkable one at Lascaux. As everybody knows, Lascaux isn't just closed on Mondays, it's closed every day of the week and every day of the year. And it is people like Dinah who enable us to enjoy these uh, great installations. And uh, uh, that particular uh, chapter is particularly fascinating as she discusses the people's problems sometimes with facsimiles. So Dinah is uh, also uh, a master of the Faculty of the World Design, as a former master of the Faculty of World Design as for industry. Um, and you, she will be presenting in a moment a, uh, her, the ideas in her book. And we, then we have Sir Charles, Sir Maurice Smith. Uh, Charles is going to chair uh, the panel discussion and invite questions from you all. Charles, of course, is a cultural historian with the distinction of having headed three of the great institutions in the UK of uh, galleries and exhibition spaces. That's he's been the director of the National Portrait Gallery, the National Gallery, and the secretary and chief executive of the Royal Academy. He's more than well equipped to know what goes on behind the scenes of the museum and indeed in the front of house of the museum. And he is publishing a book himself on the art of museum in modern times will be published in March. Uh, and thirdly, and with particular pleasure, we are joined by Frances Folding. I say particular pleasure because she is, of course, uh, Lund Humphrey's author. Um, indeed, I'm sure that I'm not the only one who thinks of Frances as the historian of 20th century British art. I've lent on her Penguin, I noticed it's a, sorry, Thames and Hudson uh, paperback and the big dictionary for many years. Uh, but we're particularly proud in our list, that's Lund Humphrey's list of having her books, her biographies of John Minton, and more recently, uh, on Prunella Club. Uh, Francis is a professor and emeritus fellow of Clare Hall in Cambridge. So without more to do, um, and while I shall say goodbye to you at the end, I will hand over to Dinah, who's going to take us through her wonderful book. Dinah. Uh, thank you very much, Nigel. Um, I've got some, um, but before we go any further, I, I've been admitting people to this. I don't know if I'm the only person that's able to do that, or somebody could take it, take on the role for me, but I'm clicking like crazy on lots of names as they come up. So maybe that's it. Anyway, so um, my book, uh, um, written, um, <laughs> Sorry, uh, share screen, where am I? Here we are. Um, um, no, sorry. PowerPoint, you, slideshow, there we go. Uh, written as I stopped working with uh, on the at the coal face with Caston Mann, and um, it was re it's really a collection of little essays and thoughts and things which are rattling around in my head 
for a long time while I was while I was working and I never had time to really investigate. So this was a, a really nice opportunity to spend time um, thinking and reading and talking to people. Firstly, the cover. This is uh, the rear view of Castor and Pollux, and I'm depending on those bottoms for my main sails. They were caught by me in the v &A galleries, looking at some of our drawings as uh, the refurbishment took place. Mm -hmm. uh, as you probably know, um, they are a fine example of heteropaternal fecundation, which means that they were the twin sons of Leda. But um, in a way, I chose them for the cover because they, they, uh, they represent this whole business of moving objects around within museums and galleries and how when you move them, um, magical things happen. They change their personalities. Um, I've divided the book into several chapters, which in a way are representing galleries in a way. So, so one chapter is very short and other chapters are much longer. Um, and one of them is about windows because I've, I've always found it very curious and annoying and sad in a way that so many of our museums, museums and galleries don't have any windows. It's like we're not allowed to look out in case we get distracted. But it's when you're looking at work um, and objects in galleries and you're able to look out onto the world outside and see it's still there and to feel that the day is passing and the weather is changing, that I think somehow the, the world makes, the work you're looking at makes a little bit more sense. Um, but I think curators hate windows. They're very um, alarming for them. They let in daylight, which is the most damaging of all things. Um, and they, they um, force them to lose control of what they're doing in a way. But of course, as visitors, that's what we like. So here, here we have the Gilbenkin um, Museum in Lisbon. And below this wonderful um, gallery by Peter Zumter in, um, in, Col in Cologne, Colomba, where what he does is he plays with the windows. He just lets the light seep through at the back. So you have to go and see, it pulls you through. It's an encourager. Um, the bottom image there is of the Natural History Museum in New York, which is exactly what curators hate, where you've got somebody that's escaped and can't resist looking out of the window. Mm. But then there's the problem of what you do with these windows and how you filter the light to stop all the damage. And in the book, I have several examples of different ways of doing it. The, the top one is the Guggenheim Museum in Venice. And the Joseph Albers windows, the Grassi Museum in, um, in Leipzig, um, which are absolutely magical, bombed during the war and now just remade and reinstated. They look absolutely fabulous. And below uh, Louisiana, one of a number of museums that if you ask people where the, what their favorite museums are, Louisiana comes up again and again and again. And it's a combination of uh, the domestic scaled rooms, but it's also something to do with these fabulous views and connection um, through the windows. The next chapter is about picture frames. It's always been a mystery to me why all pictures seem to be wrapped with similarly over carved and gilded frames. <coughs> and it took me a long time to work out why this was and what happened. Um, but of course, one of the things that gilded carved frames do is to say this picture, picture is finished and this picture is valuable. So here we have a John Constable. I'm sure it is very valuable. Um, but what's interesting about them is uh, that they, they're actually telling a different story from the art that they contain. So this top row of images, which I haven't got in the book because I wasn't, I couldn't get permission to use them, are four portraits by Soutine of the same man, who's a maître d'hôtel. And because for, for, for various reasons, Soutine's pictures tended not to go to museums, they went to collectors. 
Um, they've all been framed by collectors uh, in a completely different way. I mean, this is, this is where you realize, of course, that there's no one way to frame anything and um, how you frame something is an opinion. But um, uh, it's very interesting how uh, here you have the whole thing of, let's pick out the red in the picture, uh, let's pick out the white in the picture. Um, and uh, th these, are, these are all uh, signs of the neurosis and the tension we have when we have to frame something. The bottom is a very interesting one because Degas uh, designed his own picture frames and he was adamant that he never wanted to have um, gilded frames around his pictures. And if he found a purchaser of one of his pictures that had changed the frame or put any gold on it, he would take it back. And uh, here we have a beautiful pastel, um, which has been up for sale in Sotheby's twice. The first time it came up, it was in the Degas frame. Second time it came up, somebody wrapped a gold frame around it because it made it look more expensive, I think. Then we have um, Bellini in Venice at the Carini Stampaglia, uh, designed by Carlo Scarpa, where he takes the frame away. And there is something extraordinarily powerful about this lack of frame suddenly. Um, it, the painting looks vulnerable and um, immediately uh, talking to us. The, when it came to London for the Mantegna Bellini exhibition, of course it was framed and was in some way diminished, I think. The next chapter is a very short chapter. It's about coat checks and how interesting it is that we are happy to go around museums carrying all our bags and things. Whereas if you go to the theatre, we, we take them off. Um, and the, the, losing your coat and bag is a sort of gesture of commitment, like you're ready. And this installation uh, made by um, in, in Darlam as part of the um, Humboldt Lab project. Uh, this was an installation by an artist, Karin Sander, and if you went to the coat check to leave your things, you were given a key to one of these display cases, and you were immediately confronted with the problem of how do you, how, how do I, how do I display this stuff? I mean, after all, most museum curators and designers are confronted with stuff. How do we display this stuff to make sense of it? And here visitors are given the job of displaying their own stuff. And then they immediately think to themselves, what is, what is it I'm trying to say here? How can I do this? Then there's a chapter about facsimiles uh, triggered by um, our project in Lascaux that, that Nigel mentioned. And as he says, the original cave is closed. And, um, a small facsimile was made, but th these are the photographs of when it was first discovered. Here are two of the boys who discovered it. And the wonderful Henri Breuil, uh, uh, a Jesuit um, abbé, who became an expert in parietal art. And here are all the uh, visitors piling in to see the cave when it was discovered in the 40s. Well, of course, then, it, then, then all the, the humidity and the carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, um, began to affect the paintings and da -da -da -da, eventually it was closed. So a small facsimile was made and then it was decided to make a bigger one. And this, this was part of our competition submission for um, uh, designing the museum that was going to the visitor centre that was going to wrap around the facsimile. And here is the facsimile here. Now, um, it, what's interesting is how people reacted to whenever I said we were working on this thing with, um, which was a facsimile, and said, oh, I'm going to see a facsimile, it's not the real thing. I mean, what's the point of going to see that? Well, point is you can't see the real thing because it's locked. And I know the woman who's got the key and there's absolutely no way you can get in. But here's another version of this, of a slightly different kind. Here is um, Veronese's painting of the marriage at Cana. Here set in its original room in Venice in the um, refectory of the um, of the wonderful complex of buildings designed by Palladio on the east of San Giorgio. And when Napoleon saw it, I mean, he uh, people came from all over Europe to, to see it. When Napoleon saw it, he liked it a lot. And he had it cut up into 
one meter widths rolled up and taken back to Paris. And then it was stitched together, framed and put in this room. Uh, I think it's, I don't think they can move it because it's, it's too big. Um, but it's, it's hung in such a way that it's so big, it hit, almost, hits, almost hits the ground. And the doorways on either side. And it happens to be in the same room as the Mona Lisa. So uh, most people uh, got their backs to it. And though recently they made a facsimile, Factor Marte made a facsimile of it. And here it is, here's the facsimile installed in Venice. So this is then about authenticity. Here we have the original painting, not in its original form, but the original painting. Here we have a facsimile of the painting in the correct room, in the correct building, at the correct height, with the correct light. And I think it answers and poses other questions about what does authenticity mean in this context. The next chapter is about um, collections and why we collect. I mean, Freud collected here some of his curious deities set out on his desk. He said it was all to do with problems with potty training. But when curators, particularly new curators, arrive at a museum and they open the cupboard, and as I say, you open the cupboard and you see all this stuff, they somehow have to find a way of wrapping some kind of narrative sense around it so that they can share this collection with visitors. What you never get in a museum is a complete set of anything. So it's impossible to think that you can tell a complete story. You've always got gaps, you've always got gaps. So hence the use of thematic displays. But Pitt Rivers had a slightly different way of doing things. He um, gathered things together and immediately mixed them. Not, I mean, he put them together not as, not as uh, geographic and uh, cultural objects. Uh, he, he put them together as different ways of, of solving a design problem, like boats, for example. So you have boats from all different countries and all different cultures put together. So you make direct comparisons. This collection down here has been put together by an old school teacher in Italy and he gathered together the tools that were being thrown away uh, uh, to talk to his kids about and to explain the lives of their parents. Uh, but he, he then got uh, given so many of these things that he began to make decorative displays on the wall. And uh, the result is this extraordinary building, which I recommend anybody to go and see, filled with these tools arranged in these amazing patterns. No text. Uh, unlike the one next door here in Fantascriti in, in Carrara, um, in Italy, uh, made by a marble worker who tells heartbreaking stories with these little labels that he writes and then he gets a nail and he bashes them into the marble walls of his open quarry where he's made this museum. And these, these are Christ figures from um, Russia, Perm, where we did a project. And these guys are waiting in the store, waiting for their turn to come out and be put on display. The House Museum is a very powerful carrier, and indeed it's a, car it's a very powerful frame, linking it back to the other chapter, because it frames uh, our visit. Um, it prepares us for what we're about to see. This is the entrance to Dostoevsky's house in St. Petersburg, and here is his hat. He has an amazing collection of wallpapers, actually. Here are Barbara Hepworth's overalls like she's just gone out to tea. This is the Melnikov house in Moscow. Extraordinary, extraordinary, wonderful house built on a bog and built uh, in this, using this very lightweight structure, creating these rather curiously shaped windows. And this is the house of Eileen Gray down in the south of France. Um, again, none of these places have text in the sense of a museum text, except she chooses, of course, to send messages to her guests. 
more collections in a way rather similar to the marble worker and the school teacher near Parma. But this wonderful place in Troyes in northern France explains different trades. It was, it's a, it was built in an orphanage and here each of these display cases shows the complete set of tools needed for a trade. But then again arranged in a sort of magically poetic way and in a way that begins to tell the story of how these tools are used, just by the way they're hung. And then this project we, that we did in Canterbury of the Beanie Museum. Um, here's Dr. Beanie. He was known as Diamond Jim because of all the jewellery he used to wear when he was operating on people. He made a lot of money and bequeathed Canterbury with enough money to build a museum. And uh, this was his hideous collection of stuff, really nasty. There's these gloves made of chicken skin. But what this was about was a museum about collections. So here you have um, the collection of Viscount Strangford, who bought one thing every six months when it was the absolutely perfect vase to fit into his taxonometric collection. Whereas our friend down at the bottom here, Mr. Lanzel, would travel around Asia and Siberia with a trunk full of Bibles, and in exchange for the Bibles, he would take anything, particularly clothes, and then he would come home and have himself photographed wearing them. The point being that these collections tell you more about the collector, really, than anything else, but that in itself, I think, is interesting. And then the final chapter is about texts. Uh, I think we've all been to museums and puzzled about the, the, the texts which are on the walls. Um, I get very upset in the book about this one for Van Gogh's chair in the National Gallery. Well, the general rule with text panel, te um, these little uh, labels, is that you're allowed 50 words because that's thought to be all people can deal with. But the one for Van Gogh's chair is 53 words, 37 of which describes exactly what you can see in front of you. And then the last sentence makes this sort of extraordinary generalization about how this is uh, intended to represent his direct and plain speaking character. Really? Uh, whereas the one above and for Garofalo is, is full of questions. And what I'm saying here is that I think labels should be they should, they should get you to think, they should get you to revisit the, what you're looking at. Have another look, do you really think that? And the question mark is one of the, the great tools for this. It's lovely that the Garofalo, they don't quite know when it was painted, for example. Everything is just unsure. And museums don't like to expose their vulnerability, but once they do, I think people love them. The, this uh, sign in Bletchley, which I wasn't allowed to use in the book, so we don't know what this is and could you, if you know what it is, could you please ring the duty manager on this phone number? Um, and immediately, you know, one looks at these things and gets interested. And in the Natural History Museum in Paris, there are a few exhibits which have escaped. So up here with all the small exhibits, exhibits and the fossils, there's a giraffe which has somehow got up there and looks down on the big displays underneath. It's a mystery, we don't know why, but there it is. And then finally, uh, I'm just looking at visitors here because, well, without the visitors, none of these museums make any sense. And of course, they are all closed at the moment. And all of these objects are looking at each other saying, where, why aren't we being looked at? Where are all our friends? But there is this curious thing like this lady here who stood in front of this rather ravishing painting to have her photograph taken. This is something we, we've all seen. She had this photograph taken six times before she let her friend go until she was satisfied that it did whatever it is that she wanted it to do. And here's another lady doing a slightly similar thing. And these two girls from the Royal Academy studying Chris Orr's painting. I mean, you know, all designers and all curators love and hate, <laughs> hate visitors. They ask difficult questions and they want laboratories and postcards but um, they are the core of what we, what we are about. Ça c'est tout. I can't hear. Can't hear Charles. 
Help. Can't hear, can't hear, can't hear. Ah. Can't hear Charles. Everyone seems to be muted. Yes, yes, yes. Oh. Sorry, sorry. I unmuted, I muted myself because there was a noise it's off and then I couldn't unmute myself. So, so welcome to everybody. And we've now got about half an hour. Uh, we're going to begin with discussion of the people you can see on the screen. And I, I'd like to start by getting Francis. I, I, I don't know, we haven't talked before. Uh, and so I'd like to hear her views of the book. Well, uh, I think the book is wonderfully engaging and it makes me want to rush into many museums I haven't yet visited in the hope of checking out certain things that Diana writes about because she writes about them in such a wonderful way that one's immediately engaged in the whole topic, the, the topics she raises, which aren't often raised in other histories of museum, uh, museums. And I particularly love the chapter on windows um, and all that you said about the role that they can and do play and why they've been so excluded in so many national galleries. Um, the, the, the National Portrait Gallery does have side windows, down there. <laughs> yes, floor. I know, Charles, there are exceptions. It's true, it's certainly true. <laughs> and how wonderful they are. You say they're, a, it's a, oh, they're all top lip. <laughs> Sorry. I think a really special uh, museum for me with regard to windows is David Chipperfield's the Hepworth in Wakefield. I just love that room where you walk in and there's a vast, unapologetically huge window and you look out and you see a weir with the, 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 the river rushing past. And you were reminded by it that, you know, you're in this industrial city in a post-industrial age, but nevertheless, the whole sense of its history and of its being there becomes just a part of your visit to the, to the museum. And you look at it afresh as a result of that. I agree with that. And, um... I mean, I think both David and Zumta have, have used these sort of similar techniques of, it's it's a wonderful, I mean, you, you, if you go to Tate Modern, for example, and if you go to the temporary ex exhibition galleries, and there's a moment when you come out and you have these windows that overlook the Thames and immediately people's faces sort of light up. And it's, and it's not fair to say that it's because they've been so miserable in those rooms, but it is the something about suddenly seeing the world out there again, which, which, is, which is extraordinary. But I know, Charles, you've had problems as a client, haven't you? Of, uh, well, that, and that's partly why I raised this in the portrait gallery, because it is tricky because it's on three floors and the middle floor only has side windows. And, and that was what Piers Goff engaged with, I, I thought successfully, and I'm looking forward to seeing what Jamie Fobert, who I see yeah. is on the screen, is going to do in the next incarnation. I noticed from having look at, looked at the ground plans, they're going to use the middle floor for exhibitions. And exhibitions, I've always found it interesting that people assume that it's important to have a kind of empty box so that you can customize it. Whereas actually, I think in both the galleries, the Royal Academy, both the main floor galleries, are very beautiful because they've got top light and and I think the Foster galleries that um, at the top the Sackler gallery is very beautiful because even if you don't have daylight you have the sense of daylight so I was very sympathetic to all of that. But also outside the Sackler galleries at the Royal Academy you you, you sort of feel you're in daylight don't you? Yeah um, you're at the top of the building. Yes I mean and there's um, something it's something about knowing just remembering what time of day it is somehow. It's, it's sort of incredibly important. Yeah, there was a huge battle at the National Gallery before my time with the Venturi uh, Sainsbury Wing because the Venturis wanted a big Venetian window at the end of the long enfilade. And of course the curators didn't. To be honest, it wouldn't have been a very nice view out because it's just across to the Canada Centre, the street. <laughs> but, but, they felt very strongly, exactly as you say and indicate in the chapter, that, that people want to see out. They, they want a sense of where they are. And but they the don't new want that sense of The new um, um, Gargosian um, up in, um, wherever it is, the big, the big one, in Grosvenor Street, wherever it is, yeah. that's got a wonderful window, um, yeah. whereas Britannia Street doesn't. I mean, what I was going to say was that but the contemporary art galleries have got the same problem. You know that they they've all taken on this 
they've all taken this sort of clone attitude to how they need to be. They need to be white, white tanks. <laughs> yes, that's right. And where where you where you're just sort of trapped somehow. Yeah. yeah. And, and so, Francis, in, in Diana's list of favourite museums, were there any that you thought were obviously missing? <laughs> oh, um, I can't really answer that. Um, it it isn't, doesn't mention a rather small one, but the, the Kettle's Yard I'm very fond of. Obviously. Oh, Kettle's Yard. Yeah. I, um, I don't know Kettle's Yard well enough, and it wasn't sort of sitting in the top of my head, and I should have mentioned Kettle's Yard. I'm actually, I should have been to see it. I should have been sick. I haven't even seen Jamie's work there yet. I'm ashamed. Slap wrist. <laughs> well, he well, does, it, it, he does so use top lighting, which I think he it takes echoes from uh, um, from Leslie Martin, who used it in the e extension to the house. So there's a continuation of that, I think, which is is very attractive. And then there's a one. Uh, and it's the sense of the domestic. Yeah. Well, the I domestic think... thing is very interesting. Yeah. Funny enough, I found some pictures last night of when we were in. Moscow, we went to the Hermitage, and um, of course they have amazing windows looking out over the water. And um, most of the window frames are very rotten, and some of them were sort of open um, and <laughs> because they couldn't close them because they were so swollen. But of course with, with COVID, uh, they keep saying we have to open all the windows because it's much better for us. So one solution to getting people back into museums is that we just open all the windows where they, where they have windows, it'd be great. Now, I completely forgot to say to all the audience, at some point in about five minutes or so, we're going to take questions for the audience. So use the chat at the bottom of your screen if you have questions. So uh, my next question, Dinah, it, I mean, I know you, rather amazingly, thanks to Land Humphreys, you were working on the bit right up to October, and here it is published in December. A miracle. Well, <laughs> miracle. I, I was incredibly impressed. So but was I. <laughs> I. I don't know whether now you've sort of delivered it and got the hard copies, whether there are things you now wish you had done differently or things you had added. I, 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 I loved your short, short, incredibly short chapter on cloakrooms, <laughs> but I sort of wanted more about I, I agree with you. I planned to do lots more of those. Um, but somehow one problem was that every time I started to do a short one, it grew. And um, of course, uh, you know, there are another six I could write because there, there are other topics that I, I mean, one very short one, which I should have put in, is about, um, I've noticed that pictures are hung more at a higher level now than they used to be. And I've also noticed that museum directors are a lot taller. <laughs> and, um, I think there's a correlation. We went to the uh, a wonderful exhibition of Michelangelo drawings at the Met and they were so high um, but I got a I got a broken neck looking up all the time and then I saw a guy in a wheelchair who was obviously having a really difficult time. But I mean, he couldn't even lie down and look up because they were so far away by, because they were, they were stacked because there were so many of them. And I said to him, are you having a really difficult time seeing this stuff? He said, and he, he let me down. He said, oh, it's all so wonderful. It's so great to see them. <laughs> and so I was absolutely hopeless, but, 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 um, I, d I think everything has moved up. I don't know if anyone else has noticed. It isn't it because in the 50s they moved down. They were trying to get away from traditional uh, academy hangs. So they tended to hang low. Well, and then in the yeah. 70s, you know, Tim Clifford and Michael Jaffe decided that it would be better if museums looked more like country houses. So that well, they, were, yes, yes. they went up. The know. great thing, of course, is that um, there's no one way of doing it, is there? So, so, you know, the likes of us are all in business because everyone keeps changing their mind. Can we, so go, can we go back to that absolutely critical one about the criticism of, um, you know, what do we need to know? What it, meaning what exactly the chapter, the one about labels and so on. Yes. I think yeah. your, your landing on the um, Van Gogh's chair was brilliant. And then you investigate what could have been told about that picture. And one of the things that you've got from the National Gallery website was that it moved from the Tate to the National Gallery because it was thought to be, it had, it had lost its modernity. This is completely inaccurate because oh. 
Uh, Courtauld, who put up the money, as you mentioned, to buy these French paintings to improve the Tate's holding in modern contempt, uh, foreign art, as it was called then, <laughs> because they were just having new galleries and needed to have a, a strong display when they first opened. Mm. It, it, relates the, it relates to the benefaction that he drew up, that he was very willing for these paintings to be housed at the Tate for quite a long time. But the ultimate purpose of the benefaction was that these paintings bought with his money would go to the National Gallery because he believed that the Impressionists and the Post-Impressionists were the heirs to the old masters. And once they got there, the story would be complete. And so That's just very think, nice. I made, didn't pick this up at all. It made me think that part of the glibness that we face when we read labels or go to websites, even at the National Gallery, for which I have huge admiration, you find this lack of knowledge, this lack of looking back uh, to find the necessary research about these pictures to really understand why did it move from the uh, tape to the National Gallery. Of course, to, the others moved at the same time and there was a huge noise and fuss about it and it's just been completely forgotten. I think that's really interesting. I mean, I well, clearly, um, I, I just scratched at this um, and um, didn't scratch deeply enough. But I, I just think the whole whole idea of him pr providing this um, fund for this is, is in itself is so interesting and extraordinary. Um, so uh, thank you for that. I mean, that this is actually going back to Charles's question. I mean, there are there's already stuff in there that I know isn't quite right. <laughs> But I well, guess, I don't know, people who are more uh, disciplined than me probably don't get that feeling quite so much. But anyway, it's tricky. Um, Daniel, because there are so many people who are so knowledgeable in the audience, I'm actually going to move to questions from the audience to encourage some interaction. Not least because I see a rather good uh, question from Nico MacDonald. I was intrigued by your comment on BBC Front Row. This is a question I was going to ask, which is why I picked up on it about post-COVID emphasis on digital interaction about gestures and personal devices. Can you share any good current examples of this? Well, uh, the, 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 both of the museums that, that we've done in France, in Bordeaux and at Lascaux, both have um, these, well, they're called the Compagnon de Visite, and they're little things uh, which you're given at the beginning. And they're not audio uh, guides, they are uh, the sort of digital interface between you and the exhibit so that you're able to um, uh, interrogate what you're looking at um, using these things. It's not for everybody and, and it's clearly problematic and a lot of people I think probably don't like them. But I think for mm. those who want to interact, um, I think you don't have to touch things any longer. I mean, you do for the, there will be the short, there'll be a short term problem because nobody can afford to rip out. I mean, we're, we're in, we're into Wilfer's law here. Um, I don't know if any of you picked up on Wilfer's law, but Wil, Wilfer in, in our, in uh, our mutual friend Dickens's wonderful book, our oh, Wilfer can never afford to have a complete outfit um, that's new. Uh, he has a new hat, but his suit is still threadbare. He gets a new suit and then his hat's already a bit dusty and his shoes have got holes in. So he's never at any one point got everything new. And in a way, I think museums are a bit like this, which is why I called it Wilfer's Law, that, that of course, everyone would like to have, you know, a completely COVID um, proof installations but we're landed with a lot of pre-covid installations and so there's going to have to be improvisation at the moment we've got nice people with anti-back spray and all this sort of dealing with touch screens but soon we won't have to deal with touch screens we can have we can have um as i say we can have these gestural things just with movement moving your arm proximity voice activation i mean there will be a new generation of interfaces which will get around that problem, I think. You, you, you haven't probably been to Mona in Hobart, which... which no, is, I haven't. Yeah, that stretches I mean, somebody, my geometry, so, I mean my somebody, geography. Somebody, somebody who read my book yeah. in the first version of it said, you won't be forgiven if you haven't seen Mona in Hobart. So I went on a day trip to Tasmania just for uh, <laughs> coronavirus. And it's really interesting because it's underground. Yeah. And 
and they've dispensed with labels altogether. Yeah. And they just yeah. give you a handheld device and everything is done. And they have three different voices so that you can get the curator and you can get the owner. Well, this, and... is, this is the other thing that I think, and we, we touched on this in the front row, which is this thing of the labels are the key, I think, to a lot of this um, uh, colonial problem. Um, the, 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 of course, of course, if you just have one label, which is written by one curator, that's, that's, it's tainted. But if you've got several labels written by several different types of people coming from different places, you're going to get a much richer view about each object. And obviously, if you can have that on your digital device and not written all over the walls, um, this is the way to do it, I think. And that's going to solve a lot of problems. OK, the next question comes from a well known uh, museum designer Callum's story, which is so much discussion around museums at the moment is around identity, community and education, which is true. Do you think that there's still a place to explore the pleasures of looking, even without any formal sense of learning? Uh, now, Francis, you, you answered this question first. <laughs> well, I mean, picking up on the, what, what you've just been talking about, but to, that leads into this is that with the, the as Di Dinah's just suggestion, you have more than one label written by more than one person. It points out that objects hold different meanings for different viewers. So if you, any kind of um, government directive as to what you should be trying to communicate in the way of themes is closing something down at the same time as it's trying to promote a new way of looking at works of art. So it's a, a hugely difficult problem. But the great joy of the of the handheld device is that it's possible that you don't have to have any any text on the walls at all, and it's all in your hands, and you direct uh, you you listen to the voices that you want to listen to. Of course, here we get into the dangers of living in your own bubble and only reading the newspapers that support your views. But but nonetheless, I think there's a way of enriching that as a way so that you can walk into a gallery and there isn't anything on the walls other than the work or that the objects are in there without anything. Or, or, I mean, I think this is true of art. I think it's much trickier in, in so I think I, I touch on this a little bit on, in the science museums and so on, because uh, the, the idea that, that objects speak is fine up to a point, but, but Baker-like machines with knobs on don't speak. And, and, you know, you, you have to have something that explains a little bit what it is. Mm. You, you're, you're unusual in having worked sort of across the divide, because my sense is that people tend to either work in natural history and science museums, which tend to be much more about information, and art museums, which tend to be much less. But you've done both. Yeah, much, much more on the first than the second, I have to say. Um, what's, what, but what is interesting sometimes when, when we have... Um, art uh, uh, deployed as, as to make illustrate a point um, and of course curators get very tense about that they don't like the paintings being used to make a point about science or to tell a bit of historical um, news so um, it, in some ways that, that was one that was one place where I picked up on a lot of these issues about framing and so on um, uh, and, and, and also, I did I, in the book I talk about um, in the British galleries where we were able to use. I mean, I think the VNA have got quite a lot of paintings that I think calling them art would be a bit generous, but they are incredibly useful as as documents and um, il illustrations, if you like. So that the the the, the Spitalfields silk painting that we have at British galleries, which is a pretty terrible painting, but it's a wonderful painting of of a dress made of Spitalfield silk and surrounded by lengths of Spitalfield silk is, is just wonderful. And by not putting a frame around it, we're, we're not saying this is art, we're saying this is an illustration. Yeah, it's interesting that, I think. So, so Dana, uh, uh, one thing I would be interested in is your attitude to your predecessors as museum and exhibition designers. Do, do, do you have heroes I mean, who were you influenced by when you came into the profession and you set up Casa Man? Uh, I suppose 
I suppose it's hard to hard to deny Carlo Scarpa was one of the key figures. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's you you didn't see, see the recent exhibition, it's on at the moment in Rotterdam, which actually makes clear that there was a whole group of other other designers at the same time in Italy. I think that I'm, that's, yeah. I'm sure that's true. Yeah. Yeah. But funnily enough, it's actually it's, Franco Albini, who I, Albini, I didn't know anything about. Well, Albini is wonderful. He did a yeah. wonderful exhibition. I mean, he did lovely museums in Genoa and um, Palazzo Rosso, Piazza Bianco, are him. And amazing. It, it's some wonderful um, where there is, there are, of course, because it's in a palazzo, there are side windows. And the paintings are hung on hinges, a bit like in the same museum. We know when you unpack those wonderful um, prints. Yeah. But the but 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 in in Genoa, the paintings and there's a handle at the side, and you can you can move them so that the light that's coming in through the window um, is just perfect for looking at the picture. Well, of course they're fixed now because you're not. Eh, eh, eh. But that that was his original idea. Um, so, so yes, he would be. He was certainly a key figure, and of course Charles and Raines. You know, I mean, yep. just this wonderful. What I loved about their work is this wonderful, um, delicate light touch of of keeping every like their house. You know, this sort of keeping everything loose and free and not sort of lumpen and heavy. I was so much in agreement with you over the that room with at least one or two walls with unframed bonars in the uh, oh. Tate Modern Exhibition in like two, 2018. It was just simply wonderful, wasn't it? Wasn't it interesting? And so uh, interesting. Because one of the interesting things about Bonnard was the way, way he painted of nailing the canvas onto the wall wherever he was. And, and quite often the walls were covered with hysterical flowery wallpaper. And you think, how can you do that? How can you paint those amazing paintings against this background? But, you know, that's focus for you. And, and a lot of the, a lot of the museums and collections you have in your last chapter are the ones which are eccentric. We tend to like eccentric. Yeah. But, you know, everybody likes its own museum, even though in, in a strict way it contravenes every orthodoxy yeah. in the book in terms of museum design. Yeah. Uh, no. A lot of ones. Yeah. I don't think. And, I don't uh, think. Um, I don't think you can use where, those. Where, um, where, where, where beginning to run out of time, and of course, as always happens, suddenly there are lots of questions. We'll take uh, one more, no, we'll take two more questions, which they are. Have you ever turned down a commission because you regarded the displaying of the collection to be impossible? No. <laughs> That's a leading question. You probably can't say. Oh, well, we're, we're tarts in this, you know. Well, I, <laughs> I put it another way. We're, we're taxi drivers, you know, and um, I suppose, it, not because it's impossible, I suppose we might if we disapprove, but I don't think we've ever been in that position. Yeah, here's one, uh, uh, final one, and then I'm going to hand back to Nigel. On the subject of windows, the Broad in LA, have you been to the Broad, which is no. odd, you go up an escalator. I, I always think it's very internalized, but it, um, it has internal windows that allow the visitor to look into the archive stores and the administrative offices. Um, that's perhaps peeling away some of the elitism and mystique. I think this is a trend of trying to open up stores. Yeah, I mean, certainly. the DNA are going to do their stores. Certainly. Well, I, we, did a, we did do a project with the Natural History Museum. Um, no, it wasn't a project. It was a competition which we didn't win. But we did have conversations with them um, in that, in the, where is, it, is it the Darwin build, the build, lobby building that they have next next door on, on Queen's Gate? Anyway, yeah. the idea was that you walk down a ramp and you had views into all their researchers in white coats doing work. But of course, it's, they're pretty deadly views, mainly because they've always gone off to have a pee or a cup of tea and they're never there. Or, no, but or people even, like that. <laughs> but even if they're reality. there. It's not terribly interesting. I mean, they're not skinning uh, rats or anything. It's not like they're, they're looking through microscopes that you can't really enjoy. But um, I think the new v &A buildings are going to be about that, aren't they? Yeah, very much so. And, yeah. and I don't know if you've been to the Brera recently, which is done by James Bradburn, another... Oh, yes. Well, the Brera's, he's done wonders there with, yeah, with no money. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just with paint. Well, that's another chapter I wanted to do on, on wall colours, you know. But, but he's he's just used paint 
and labels, you know, yes, brilliant. Okay, last thought, Francis. Oh, goodness. Final thought. Well, I just think it's 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 a superb book. It's you know beautifully illustrated, but it's it's just so off the moment, and and it's asking questions about museums that I don't think other people have asked. So it's thrilling, and thank you very much, Diana, for producing it. Oh well, thank yeah. you, Francis. And I, I will add that absolutely, it's very thoughtful. It makes people look. I hope lots of people will buy it because it's unexpected. It's not. It's it, it's it's unconventional. It makes you think about things you wouldn't necessarily have It's very funny too in places, isn't yes. it? Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay, Nigel, over to you okay. to finish. Yes, thank I you will, to the though. audience. Thank you to Dinah. Well, thank you, Charles. Well, thank all of you on the panel for that fascinating discussion. Uh, you've already identified that Dinah must start writing all the bits that you want to now write that you've left out of this wonderful book. And uh, thank you for the audience for and our participants for their questions. I'd like to make just a couple of points I think we've made. Not only is this a great read, it's a great look. The, the photos are, as Christopher Ray, Freilich in his introduction makes point, very witty and very good, including that, that uh, case of the uh, Veronese, which is great fun. And the other thing for, for us, as we end, uh, hopefully to see the end of the COVID restrictions, at the end, there's a list of museums mentioned in the book it's just a list of places I absolutely want to go to tomorrow, um, places that Diane has been and unearthed. Uh, this is a wonderful subject. Now, thank you all. When we can start traveling, we shall follow your ideas, uh, Diana, and uh, enjoy your actual work as well as read your book. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. You. Yeah. I'm raising your glass yeah. to you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay. I'm going to go and find the glass. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dana. Thank you, Francis. Yeah, thank you. See you soon. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.